Thank you, Trisha. That was not just beautiful, but very touching, beautiful to hear, think about Jesus, that he was broken and spilled out for us, you know. And then to think about the woman, you know, in the, in the account in, in John chapter 12, it says that Judas got on her case and said, hey, you should have kept that money because it was a year's wages and we could have used that for the poor people. And uh, Jesus stood up and said, leave her alone. She's done what she could. You know, and, and so when I think about that story, that true story, not a myth, not something that is made up, but a true story of our Lord Jesus Christ and his encounter that day, I, I think about that, that she did what she could. Let's think about that as we are earthen vessels. Amen? The Bible says that we carry this treasure in earthen vessels, that the glory may be of God and not of us. And so let's think about that vessel and in our brokenness, you know, we're all broken. And let's allow that brokenness to reveal God's strength. In my weakness, Paul said, your strength is made manifest. So, Lord, we do. We thank you. We thank you, God, for uh, not just the story, but the example, Lord, of, uh, of Mary who, who broke that vessel, that precious vessel. And, and Father... Uh, Show us, Father, how we can serve you in the simplest way, to do what we can for you and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, yeah, thank you for considering the gift to uh, India. We haven't been on a mission trip, a foreign mission trip for a while, but we're planning to return to India. Maybe uh, you would like to consider coming in October. Uh, we're open to that as the Lord leads. I, we can help you to, to raise funding and go there. Uh, the first mission trip that we went on from uh, internationally uh, from Kohala Baptist was to China. And that was in 2000, and we returned to China many times, probably seven times. But while we were there, on about the third trip, we met some missionary girls who were artists. And I said, well, that's cool. What are you doing? And they said, well, we've established a relationship with some people up in the mountains. They were tribal people, and uh, they're weavers. And so we're sharing the gospel with them by asking them to weave gospel stories. And then we tell them about that. So this was, uh, I picked this up in, in 2002, I think, or whatever. But it says, uh, triumphant entry. And it was woven by these hill tribes people who were getting the gospel Shared with them, and and as Guy mentioned, part of our our mission to India is to reach out to the Dalit people and the tribal people. The Dalits are the untouchables, the ones that are rejected by the culture, by the religion, and by the society. They're told that they are less than human. And they can only take the most subservient servant tasks. They can never rise above. The, the last name always defines who they are. And um, those, those audio Bibles are going to go to the, the tribal people. So please consider a gift to the India Mission uh, Maybe you weren't prepared for that today, but by next week, and then we're going to, we're hoping to raise around $3,000, 
to pay for those tracks and biting, audio biting. It's always my, my habit, my uh, method of preaching to kind of follow the uh, liturgical uh, lead of the scripture, you know, and preach about, uh, you know, Palm Sunday. Um, but I, I have been challenged, and I, I want to... Uh, you know, follow through on that challenge, and that challenge is to uh, stay with the the text that we've been in for the last couple of months, and that is John chapter eight. But it's a beautiful story of the Lord Jesus, you know, in in his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And let me just point out one thing: I won't I won't stay on that theme. In, in uh, John chapter 12, and it talks about him coming and riding on a donkey, a humble donkey, as the song shared. You know that that was a prophetic word from the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9 of Zechariah. And Zechariah lived over 500 years before Messiah. And he said, Behold, your king comes, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey. That was the triumphant entry prophesied and predicted. And it says they they grabbed their palm fronds and, uh, you know, they went out to, to meet him. That was a something that had originated the waving of the palm fronds had been a national symbol for the about 200 years prior to Messiah riding in which signaled their fervent hope that the liberator the Messiah had arrived and of course they shouted hosanna which means save now Hosanna, save now. Oh, Lord, you are the only one who can save us. Save us now. Hosanna in the highest. So we're going to be in John chapter 8. And we're going to look at uh, verses 21 through 30. Turn with me to John chapter 8. And just as a way, by way of review, let me just uh, remind us that uh, Jesus was in Jerusalem attending the Feast of Tabernacles. He had revealed himself as the living water. He stood up at that opportune time as they were pouring out the water for the drink offering. And he said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. After that event, he was teaching in the portico, the the porches off of Solomon's temple, when they brought the adulterous woman to him. And we spent an entire Sunday meditating on what he said to her. Woman, where are your accusers? There are none, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go, therefore, and sin no more. Soon afterwards, he declared in chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. The second great I am statement. Still, the Jewish leaders rejected his witness and challenged his claims to be the Messiah. And so we pick up in chapter 8, verse 21. Here we go. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. 
You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, capital H, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as the Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many people believed in him. Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our spiritual eyes to, to see and our spiritual ears to hear what you have for us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus tells them, they've again convened around him. He is, uh, people are beginning to follow him because of his miracles, because of his claims to be the Messiah. And so they gather again. He goes, I'm going away. And you will seek me and will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. They had openly rejected the witness not just of the Messiah, Jesus himself, but of John the Baptist, the messenger, as he started out in, in uh, John chapter 1. The, the witness of the Father who said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased at the baptism of Jesus. His very works, the miracles, which spoke of the power of the Father and the, the witness of Scripture, which prophesied that he would come and that he fulfilled. Now, he reveals the consequence of the rejection. There is a consequence for rejecting the Messiah. And here, he says, you will die in your sins. There will be spiritual death. When you leave this earthly body, you will still be in your sin. Sin brings death. Romans 6.23. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, a very important scripture to uh, memorize. Romans 6, verse 23. This is the entire gospel in one verse. If you don't have it written in your heart yet as a believer, I encourage and challenge you to. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. It's very simple and very plain. But they weren't getting it. They weren't getting it. He goes on and he goes, where I go, you cannot come. You can't come. If you're still in your sin, God cannot fellowship with sin. Heaven is a perfect place. Sin will not enter there. We must deal with our sin. And the Bible tells us how. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Faith in Jesus. Faith in His atoning work. Faith in what He did on Calvary. Where I go, you cannot come. Where, where did He go? Where did Jesus go? Turn to... John 14, just a few pages on from our passage. John 14, very famous, very familiar, very beautiful. This is one of my most favorite passages. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled, Stephen. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. But Thomas says unto him, saith unto him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Verse 6, a very important passage. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Jesus is either telling the truth or he's not. This passage is what brought me to Christ. Because I was believing in a God. I was believing in a God of my own fabrication. It was like the cosmic fruit salad. You go through the shopping mark with a with a shopping cart, and you, you pick out what you like here, and what you don't like, you leave it, and you pick it all up, and you put it all together, and that's your God. But Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. I said, wow, he's speaking to me. I do believe in God, but I don't know. I, I, it, I This thing about Jesus being the only way, I, I don't really believe it. And so I had to be open and honest with God and say, you're going to have to reveal yourself to me. If you are the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through you, God, I want to know. I want you to show me. Please show me. Let me just ask you or let me just submit to you that asking God to show you and reveal himself to you is a good prayer. God will do it. He will reveal himself to you. But it says here that he goes to prepare a place for us. That's, that's where God is. Now, we know that God is near, as Jubal mentioned in our uh, worship, that God is near. Draw near to God. He will draw close to you. He will reveal himself and show himself real to you. But on this earth, as we look at the earth and the things that are going down on the earth, we know that this is not the kingdom. The kingdom is where the king is and where he rules and reigns. And praise God, I can see the kingdom here in you where the king sits on the throne. But thy kingdom come, Lord, is coming, coming back. Where I go, I to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also, and I will come and get you, he said. The Bible clearly teaches that the Lord is coming back. He is returning. What is he returning for? He's returning to establish his kingdom, for to uh, snatch his bride, and to establish his kingdom here on this earth. It's going to be just. It's going to be righteous. It's going to be loving kindness. That's the king we want. Hallelujah. And it's coming. Praise God for that. Just as Jesus rode in on the donkey, he's coming back, but he's not going to be on the donkey. The donkey, when a king in the uh, Jesus time wanted to go on a mission to the next town and, and be at peace and say, hey, we want to establish a peace treaty. He rode on a donkey. It was a sign. It was a symbol of peace. Humble, humility. I'm not coming to get you. I'm coming to die for you so that you can have peace. Peace with the Father, peace with yourself, peace with your fellow man. He was on a peace mission, but when he comes back, the book of Revelation tells us he will be riding the white horse. His eyes will be the flame of fire. He will have a sword, which is the word of God. And it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be judgment day. Judgment day. And that's why it's so important to, while the door of grace and peace is open, to come to the Lord. Recognizing who you are as a person who has rebelled. And the one who can forgive you is waiting. So the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says, where I go, you cannot come? Perhaps they were confused. What's he, what's he going to do? 
They're trying to make sense of Jesus' words. Most likely it was more of a mockery. As Jewish tradition condemned suicide as a sin that resulted in permanent banishment to the worst part of Hades. And they were saying, hey, we're not going there. Look at us, we're righteous. Maybe he's going to kill himself and he'll be down there where we can never go. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. Oh, now it's starting to get, you know, tough. You are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Jesus declared that his opponents, and he had opponents, they were enemies of the cross. He declared that his opponents, true kinship, was with Satan and his realm. Thus they were spiritually blinded. They were spiritually blinded. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verse 3. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Last week, we saw that Jesus claimed to be the light of the world. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. But if you don't follow, then you walk in darkness. And it's the God of this world who blinds us and deceives. The deception is thick in this world. All you need to go is go down and look at the local bulletin board and see all of the the humanistic and, and honestly, just openly deceptive satanic stuff that you can go invest your time in and and, uh, your money in and your, your prayers in. The God of this world blinds the eyes. We need to be praying, praying for our brothers and sisters, our relatives, our acquaintances, our co-workers. God, open their eyes to see who you are. You are the light of the world. Hallelujah for that. And then verse 24 of our passage. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. Because you're blinded, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, capital H, Messiah, you will die in your sins. That is a sad reality. But it is a reality. But it doesn't have to be your reality. You don't have to die in your sins. You can confess your sins. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Hallelujah. The door is still open. But the truth will not budge. It's not moving. Jesus didn't budge. He didn't run from these guys into the conversation. He confronted them. He confronted them with truth about who he was, and about what the word says. I am the Messiah. If you believe in me, you shall not hunger and thirst. He said, I'm the bread of life. He who believes in me will never never hunger or thirst. I'm the light of the world, he declared. Eternal life is given through Jesus Christ. Relationship is restored with the Father through faith in the atoning work of the Son. It's a mystery. It sounds like foolishness. How can that happen? To tell you the truth, I don't know. But it happened. It happened. And if you don't believe it, you will carry it to the grave and your destination will be accordingly. You will go to be with the one who deceived you. This is true of the angels who rebelled against God and all those who choose to remain in their rebellion. Hell is a 
real place. Just as heaven is a real place. Jesus declared, I go to, pl- to, to pre- pre- prepare a place for you that where I am. You know, with the Father. That's what God has prepared for a man who will repent. But he has prepared a place for the devil and his angels. And all those who will not receive the atoning sacrifice of his son. You know, that place is referred to as uh, Sheol or Hades, Gehenna, the place of eternal fire. Mark 9, let's look at that for just a minute. Mark 9, verse 43. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark 9, beginning in verse 43. Mark 9, 43. If your hand causes you to sin... Cut it off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. Now, this passage is not suggesting that you maim yourself and cut your arm and your eye and your hand, your hands off. You know, that's not going to help you. You can't do that. What he's saying is this is how much God hates sin. And so whatever it is that is causing you to walk in a continual way with sin, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Because there is a place where sin will be judged. And he quotes from Isaiah 66, where the fire is not quenched, the worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. That's Isaiah. It's a very real place. And hallelujah, Revelations chapter 1. We don't like to read about hell because it's a scary place, but Revelation 1, 17, after the resurrection... John had a vision of Christ, a revelation. Revelation 1, 17. He saw Jesus. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And be, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Let me say that Jesus holds the key. And you don't need to go there. I pray that you consider the words of our Lord. Why did Jesus have to die? If there was any other way for our sins to be forgiven, Jesus would not have had to go to the cross. But he did. And he went for you. And he went for me. Psalm 86, verse 11, says it all. Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all of my heart. And I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol, the place of the dead. You have delivered my soul. Hallelujah. How wonderful it is to have your soul delivered from the fear of death. Praise God. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Then he said to him, then 
They said to him, who are you? Verse 25 of our passage in John 8. And Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. (laughs) From the beginning of his ministry to his chosen people, the Jews, Jesus clearly, clearly declared his deity and his claim to Messiahship. He could have been much more terse. He could have said, are you guys kidding me? After all that you have witnessed, are you still wondering about the very basic nature of my claims and my identity? But he didn't. He didn't say that. He said, verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard from me. Jesus is again saying, I am God's son. And I only say the things that the Father tells me. He's done that already earlier in this book. If it were up to me, I would say a lot more, and it might not be all that nice. That's my paraphrase, okay? We can learn from his example. Jesus was quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. James 1.19, very important truth for us to apply to our lives. Verse 27, they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Again, their blindness did not allow them to see Christ clearly for who he was as the Son of God. Or to hear him clearly. As to what he was saying. I pray that this morning we hear clearly what Christ is saying. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. And I am the Savior. Hosanna, save now. Verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He, the Messiah. And that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak these things. Jesus is on his way to the cross. He's foretelling his passion and his crucifixion, as he did in earlier in the gospel account of John. John, turn back to chapter 3 and look at verses 14 and 15. John 3, verse 14. He said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you all know, do you remember the story, the true story of the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness? And they began to complain and complain and complain about their situation and what they didn't have, you know, and and they were uh, complaining to God. And of course, they went to God's man, Moses, and were complaining. And and God said, okay, I've had enough of this. He goes, told Moses to take a pole, hammer out a brass serpent, put it on the pole and hold it up. And anyone who looks to it would be healed of the bite of the vipers. Now, think about it. They could have gone, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm not looking at that thing. That's not going to help me. It's a picture. It's a type and a shadow of Christ being lifted up on the cross for people to look at, to look at him. You can find that story in Numbers chapter 21, verses 5 through 9. The Messiah is going to be lifted up on the cross. And when this happens, you will know that I am he because I am fulfilling the prophetic word that was written in Numbers. When I know, when you, when this happens, you'll know that I'm him. The one who provides healing to all who come to me and look to me. And actually, even those who reject me are going to acknowledge me. We know this from Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 
and 11, that 8 through 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So yes, they're going to know that Jesus is the Messiah. Even those who reject him are going to know, but it's going to be too late. In fact, Jesus was prophesying beyond his actual cross work to his second coming. See if you can follow me with this. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Zechariah, one of the last minor prophets. Right after Haggai, Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. When they will look on me whom they pierced, Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. He's talking about the gathering of the remnant after the tribulation. They will be there and they will recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. They will look upon the one whom they pierced. And turn to chapter 13, verse 1. And in that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanliness. Hallelujah. You know, God is, God is doing something today. Maybe he's speaking to you personally about your need to be cleansed, to be made whole, to be forgiven. But he is doing something much bigger than we can ever do. Think or imagine. He created the earth and the universe with his spoken word. And he sent his son in order to pay the price for our rebellion in the garden. And he is coming back. And this day will occur when all of those, one third of the surviving nation of Israel, will look upon the Messiah and cry out and say, We killed the Son of God. Have mercy upon us, Lord. And it says all Israel will be saved. He's talking about at that time, all of that remnant will be saved. Hallelujah. This is the kingdom of God coming to the earth. So let me ask you a question in closing. Have you looked to the cross of Christ personally? And if so, what did you see there? I saw a cross every week when I was raised in a a church, but I never was confronted with my sin or need for the cross. I was told about a a social good, good man, Jesus. He was a good man. He did a lot of good things. You be a good boy. I needed to hear, you are not a good boy. You are a little sinner boy, and you need to repent and come to to the Savior. I wish someone had told me when I was five years old and I was stealing candy from the neighbor's house. The guilt and the burden of it was so heavy that I just just would crawl into a little space and curl up like in a fetal position because of the weight of the sin. I, I knew it. I wish there was a way to be free, but I just was following my flesh. So, what do you see when you look to the cross? First of all, do you see and acknowledge that it actually happened? That this is a historical event? You can read about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his life in the historians, Josephus and others, who kept records. It is a true historical event. So, if, so you believe in a historical Jesus, okay. Okay. So why did this historical figure have to die like this? It was because of his claim. 
to be the Son of God and to be the Messiah, making himself equal with the Father. It was for blasphemy, blasphemy that he was rejected, mocked, humiliated, and put to death. The religious leaders at this time made a decision, and now you must make a decision. I made that decision on April 2nd, 1982. I saw my sin. I wanted to be free from it, and I asked God to forgive me. There was another reason besides the blasphemy charges against Christ that made him go to the cross, and that was you and me. Jesus went to the cross for you and for me. He died for you. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That was me. I didn't know anything about it. And he did it. And yet when I came in faith, repenting of my sin, And turning to the one who could save me, he saved me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, we're all sinners. We're guilty as charged. God is perfectly holy and just and must judge sin. Jesus was lifted up on the cross for you and me. Verse 29, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do the things that please him. In Isaiah 53, it says that it pleased the Lord to wound him and to break him. That through his sacrifice, many might come to the truth. As he foretold his passion and crucifixion, He affirmed his union with his father. He wasn't backing down. He said, this is the way it is. He was without sin. Therefore, he perfectly fulfilled his father's will. You remember in the garden of Gethsemane? There at the foot of the mountain of of Olives, in the garden, he went to the Lord, the father, and he said, Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. And there was silence. And he went back again and he prayed the same prayer. And there was silence. And he went back a third time. And then he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It was part of the Father's plan. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Many recognized their need. They heard his straightforward words telling them that he was the Messiah. They would die in their sins if they didn't turn to him in faith and repentance. The message is the same today. Turn to Jesus, look to him, place your faith in him, confessing your sins, and he will save you. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, he will save us. Hallelujah. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Hallelujah. I think that's a good stopping place. Consider the claims of Christ. He says, I am the only way. If there was any other way, he would not have had to go to the cross. He went to the cross for you and for me. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for uh, your truth, Lord. So clear, so clear, Lord. Thank you, Father, for opening my eyes. I pray, Father, that, that you would open the spiritual eyes of all of us to see you and to come to you, to turn away from our flesh, from sin and from self, and to turn to you. Lord, if there be anyone here today, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would uh, lift that burden from their heart as they confess you as Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we don't have to walk in fear of judgment. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who are called according to his purpose. 
Father, thank you for calling us out of the darkness into your marvelous light. We give you all the praise and all the glory. Use us in these last days, Father, to be your messengers. Speak the truth and walk in the truth so that the darkness of this world might be exposed. And those that hear of you might find new life in Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you for coming today, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit keep your hearts and minds in Christ today and throughout this week. God bless you, and go in peace.